Welcome to the Inspired Business Leaders Podcast, brought to you by Inspire Wealth, bringing you interviews with top business professionals, empowering you to understand our current business climate and the successes and struggles other business professionals have overcome. Here's your host, Nick Boer. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Inspired Business Leaders Podcast. As always, I am your host, Nick Bohr with Inspire Wealth, and I have a special guest with us today, Ramsey Swice from, I, I don't want to butcher it, Ramsey, it's, it's Akama Technologies? Akama Technologies. Okay. This is, as, as, as a lot of my audience know, I've done a lot of due diligence research, talked to a lot of different digital marketing companies, a lot of different strategists in different areas within digital marketing. Um, this is, this is a, a real treat for me. Uh, Ramsey and his firm have been doing this since 2004. So as, as, as Ramsey, I'm sure you've, you've experienced, you know, it seems like every other person that I talked to right before or right during COVID, everyone was doing digital marketing. Oh yeah, I can do this. Oh yeah, I can do that. And I find it so exciting and interesting that you really consider yourself and your firm experts in, in, in being proactive and tactical and helping businesses grow and adapt based on the current economy and demographics. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Nick. It's a pleasure. Yeah, no, glad uh, glad we could do this. So, Ramsey, tell tell our audience, tell us a little bit about you know your story and your background, and you know how how you got started, and and let's just get into it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. I'm very honored, and uh, I hope that um, your audience will walk away with uh, that much more information about our industry, that much more knowledgeable. So I started the company um, back in 2004. Uh, I got recruited by another um, agency that was that had um, immediate success. They grew quite quite fast, and I came on board as a uh, sales manager, became vice president of sales, and then eventually VP of the agency. And um, I didn't necessarily agree with their operations and um, uh, the inefficiency that that I was able to spot early on. So I decided to, you know, create my own agency. And I started off as a search engine marketing company and learned SEO, adopted SEO, uh, used to source web design out to some local developers. And um, basically, soup to nuts, I, I architected the user experience for the website. I mapped out the site map and handed it over to them, basically closed the deal for them, and um, was never really happy with the results. So they're not smarter than me. They're not smarter than the folks I, I have on, on board on my team. So we went ahead and, and just became web developers. So we, we brought in some very smart people and kind of trained them to think the way we think and adopt our philosophy and practices, and became a full circle agency at that time. So of today, we're considered, you know, a boutique agency as a result. Wow, that's uh, that's great. So yeah, you know, it's it's always interesting because I think, you know, I speak for you know some of our audience that you know it's it's always great to hear from people that came from the corporate world like myself, like yourself, like some of our other, uh, you know, interviews that we've done and, and realize, you know, rather quickly that, you know, I like some of this, but I don't like this. I think I could do a better job over here and really just, you know, I use the analogy, take the bull by the horns and go start Mm -hmm. your own firm that you feel you could grow and be a resource and help local businesses. That's true. That's the passion, right? That's what, that's yep. what drives you to wake up early in the morning, be the first in the office and, you know, the last to leave the office and without a break in a sweat. Absolutely. Okay. You yeah, know, that's, uh, that's always the, 
that's always the joys and, and, and also some of the some of the, the I don't burnout's the wrong word, but some of the also like, hey, I work twelve, fifteen hour days some days because I have that passion and because I care so much not only about the business but about about the clients. I, I I'm so vested in helping them that sometimes, you know, it's I, I need to take a step back because, you know, I, I, I don't want to to overdo it. I my my uh, one one of my my operations manager tells me she jokes with me all the time. Uh, hey, don't, you, you, workaholic, go home. Don't work too much <laughs> because it seems like you know. Heard that you, once or twice before. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and you know, Ramsey, as 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 the business leader and the entrepreneur, you, your mind never shuts off. Your brain is always going. You're always thinking of something. Yeah. What could I have done better, different? How could I have helped them sooner? How can we take it to the next level? All of those things are always, I think, crucial uh, from that strategic thinking perspective if you're a business owner. It's, it's within your DNA. Your, your, your client, and, and consider our clients to be partners, your partner's pain is your pain. And, yep. um, yeah, yeah I, I, completely, I completely relate with that. And uh, that's what makes, you know, a partnership rather than having a customer, right? Um, Absolutely. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was uh, he was interviewed once and um, I, and I remember it vividly in my younger years. Uh, you know they they asked they asked him how do you like your job and and he was offended by that. Uh, not a job, you know. I I if you want to consider it a job, I punch the clock, I go out, I, I play my passion, I exude my passion for two hours, and then I punch the clock and go home, if that's what you mean by a job. But I don't consider it work. It's, it's who I am. It's what I strive to be. And, and I don't know how to look back. I want to keep improving, make sure I'm getting my play time every single game. So it was, it, that, that was an inspiration for me because I, I, I kind of felt that way in my younger years. Like, I'm, is this really a job? Is it work? It's, it's not. I really enjoy it. Right. No, and I think, uh, you know, I feel the same way it, it, in my field as well. I mean, I'm, I'm 20 years into, into the financial services industry, and I, I, can't, I can't ever imagine doing anything different. Uh, you know, I get, to, I get to help people, you know, realize their goals and, and, and their dreams and retirement. And so, I mean, that's, it's, it's the same way as an entrepreneur. You know, you started – you started your your business not only because it was you felt like it was a calling and a passion and you just loved doing it, but it it evolves and it grows and it's just what else could you imagine yourself doing? Like that's just it's like like you said, it's your DNA. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So tell me, you know, I'm really interested to hear. Um, you know, tell me on on the on the full gamut, like what what are you guys? What are you guys doing? What, how do you feel your, your company is uh, doing things you know, non-traditional, like meaning out of the box, helping businesses continue to grow? Um, you know, I know you, you, you talked about you know, you, case studies and, and things like that that you've done over the years, and I think our audience would love to hear some of that feedback and what's working, what you've kind of done or adapted to for some for some industries and been able to help them even through COVID. Yeah, funny you mentioned COVID because it, it forced us to evolve at a at a much more rapid rate, and um, it was the unknown that that we all feared. Yeah, for those that lived through that that, that short era, um, and. We just know what we know. You know, we, I, in my, my lifetime, I never experienced anything as traumatic as that in, in my life or the sky was falling, you know, right. every single day and it, it, there was no hope, right? Just yep. the unknown. And we've seen businesses come and go and not to any uh, lack of effort. There was just, they, they had no opportunity and, um, we sat down as a team collectively um, and and asked ourselves the same questions. How do we help? It, it wasn't about us, like, fear of losing business. 
we were, we were fear, feared more of our clients closing their doors and with the relationships that we've grown and fostered over the years, that was our, our biggest concern. And that really made us lose sleep. And we've seen some people lose their businesses as, yeah. as a result. So we, we just, you know, stepped back and began following the trends. Your, your first instinct is to go to Google and perform search, uh, research, and look at the various trends. Um, a lot of it was panic. A lot of it was uncertainty. A lot of it was, um, you know, protecting um, what they worked hard for and uh, keeping their jobs intact. Yeah. And th- this is like the very beginning, right? So yeah. we were contacted by a small family chain of restaurants, franchise. Okay. And they were on the verge of losing um, their restaurant. So it's a small business. We consider them to be in a small, not medium. And their struggles were transformation. Hey, this, this uh, DoorDash, you know, Uber Eats delivery service is we spent $180,000 this past year just on deliveries. That's money we're losing. And our clients have to, you know, their, their, their customer base has to pay for that because yeah. it's, it's about, you know, almost 30% in some cases, you know, higher. Um, and as you know, food margins in that industry are, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very small. Right. And so they were forced to um, change their menu, the pricing, um, their website wasn't cutting it. Um, and they didn't have much of a social presence. There was no effort, no emphasis on that. Um, they didn't see value in it. Um, and they were too busy, right? They were just too busy to do those things. Right, right. So we came in, we performed an audit, and that's a very broad use of uh, the term audit. We went in and sat with them, looked at their POS system, um, learned the sales of each of their locations, uh, how DoorDash was integrated with their overall business and um, what were their what were their current marketing dollars and what was the return and was it measurable so some some basic signals that we look for right so diving in we're pulling this information out we're building what we call a um, marketing requirements document so as now we put on our business alice hat and say what do we do how do we formulate a plan for this business, regardless of it being food and beverage, um, manufacturer, a uh, construction company, a doctor's office, plastic surgery, it doesn't matter. If you don't have the basic fundamentals and the understanding of a business and its operations, then you're just a PPC you know, operator. You're just a web design company. It has no vested interest in their success. One and done, they move on. Um, put it on autopilot and run your ads, and that's how they meet their margins, right? For us, we sat back and said, what is meaningful to this business, and how do we leverage it? What are the trends? What are p- People have to eat, so what are their search trends, and, and how are they engaging with these restaurants? So we did the research, formulated a plan, and made a recommendation to first scrap your website. We need a, a proper user experience with an intuitive menu, and we have to establish paths to conversions that are very economized and very simple and mobilized, meaning mobile device phones. And it worked. You know, they had tremendous success with their existing business. They saw more activity. They had analytics on their old website, and um, and it was growing incrementally uh, fast. And and then we learned about their in our due diligence and research and planning and learning phase. We learned that their POS system was quite advanced, and they were not leveraging it nowhere near what they could have. So what we did is we integrated their POS system with their website and uh, optimized 
um, for mobile, and their sales started to increase because you're going directly from device, which is tracked and measured, and it could be your mobile device, it could be a desktop. Well, 90% of their business converted to mobile, so the mobilization effect was taking place as planned and expected because it was more intuitive mm-hmm. and user-friendly. And, right. and then these orders would go from mobile device to the POS system, and the chefs, the line cooks, they're all working. They're, they see the orders. They're preparing the meals, and DoorDash numbers came down. They hired deliveries, um, uh, their own delivery folks, and they were making, you know, uh, yielding greater profits and also providing jobs and paying out their, their teams the full delivery cost. So they were not making any profit on the deliveries to keep their, their staff happy and the consumers happy not passing that cost on to them. So they got better control of their food costs and became more profitable by avoiding the delivery services as much as possible. They still have some. And the time to order was turned much quicker and less, fewer and fewer phone calls were taken, and their in-store dining tapered down to a near nil, and some of it not by choice. They had to shut their their stores, their you know the dining right. rooms. Right. So it was a hundred percent delivery. Well, they took that data after six months. Um, they started off with very few sales to uh, nearly eight times. And I'll throw a number that our goal was 5,000 per location okay. in additional online orders. And we've, you know, we, we've passed that number um, wow. on a per, per location basis. Wow. They identified um, that the, the inefficiencies with the proper configuration of their POS system and how the mobilization um, showed that the dining room was irrelevant at one location. They shut it down. Um, one location they had, they experimented with, was pure delivery. They decided, well, we've got less staff. We've got less overhead. You know, napkins, you know, cleaning dishes, dishwasher, all, all that kind of goes away, mostly. Yeah. And their profit margin, they were yielding a tremendous margin on deliver, doing deliveries only, and they've kept that store of pure delivery as a model, and now they're rethinking their business approach and wow. the models of, of their restaurants as a result. I don't want to say that, you know, we take complete credit for that, but the data doesn't lie in it, and, and we were able to extrapolate that data and with the modeling to show them, um, and they're sharp people too. I mean, they see they see the, the dashboards on their POS system, and it's telling them, it's screaming, hey, close close your dining rooms and make it pure, you know, at least now, pure delivery business. Hmm. So we leveraged Facebook, Instagram, and that led to surpassing their sales goals. And once they felt comfortable, we knew that there was an application, a phone app, that is uh, could be configured with their POS system. Okay. So we went native, right? So our all of our promotions and experimentation we did with the menus on the website and uh, social media promoting, uh, say you know combo meals and and uh, catering and 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 um, some of their off peak hours. We ran unique promos on their off peak hours and then their dine-ins um, increased or products that um, uh, on their menu that they felt that it could could improve. They they changed the the uh, uh, the recipes and 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 it started you know to blossom again. Hmm. Luckily, thank God. Um, right. So now this this native app this native app is now their number one method of return on ad spend because. Now we do SMS. We push to the app. So we started spending money on ads on social media to promote the app. Nick promoted the app for unique promotions, and it is blowing up for them. That's you know what Ramsey, and that's the kind of that's the kind of strategic partnership that I feel like a lot of these 
a lot of these companies, whether it's small or mid-sized businesses, th that they need. They need someone mm -hmm. that's going to come in, analyze, okay, where were they? Where are they now? What has changed? How can we strategically put our heads together and figure out what are some alternative things we can do to try to, to try to grow that again and to try to do things a little differently out of the box. So, you know, exactly. I, and what, I think it's, great. It's, it's data, data drives that, right? Yep. I'd like yep. to, I'd like to, to, to say that, oh yeah, we had this grandiose old plan and we had everything outlined and the framework was in, in, instituted and it, it just began running and everything was smooth. We had our challenges. You know, we had our challenges. The client had her challenges. There was a couple times where the stress of their business and not being able to hire the proper staff and, and maintaining you know, the business that that we were that we were growing and um, you know there were challenges and it, and it wasn't nice sometimes, but it, right. we figured it out. It, it was just two steps forward, you know, one step back scenario. Uh, I hate to be cliche, but it was um, having the perseverance. The, the the drive the not understanding what failure is and then trusting your partner which is a number one um, in our book and uh, and you never want to disappoint we're able to figure it out now we're getting into more with all the efficiencies in place you know the return on ad spend is, is uh, 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 quite measurable and and um, the value is there and the relationship is strong now we're getting into smart money. Now is when you start ratcheting it up and trying to increase your, your footprint on a per location basis and being more creative with the offers and knowing that if I sell this product, my margins are X, that, uh, you know, and other products, we can afford to do even greater incentives to build our, our customer base and, uh, and provide a, uh, a quality product. And then their reviews start going up and they start, you know, and they, they were building their social profile and it was just so much fun to watch them grow um, and figure things out along the way. But, yeah. you know, you need, you need a strategic, tactical understanding of, first of all, the basic business fundamentals, right? Yeah. Um, a blueprint or a plan. And then launch, measure, rinse, repeat. Yep. It's it's that simple. Once once you have once you have those silos of information filling, um, the, the that is a huge accomplishment. Now what do we do with this data and how do we improve and how do we economize, you know, yep. the ad spend and, and optimize for the greatest possible outcome for the least spend on a uh, per conversion basis. Well that's that's always the that's always the goal, right? Is to Let's, let's look at the data, let's analyze, and if, if we feel like we can improve upon the cost per conversion or the cost, the cost per click, how do we do that? What's the, what, 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 yeah. what's the best way to, to make those incremental changes so that we can improve the cost per click and lower that down or bring that down for, per conversion? So I think that's, I think that's yeah. great, and that's, that's a real-world scenario Ramsey I mean you, you, you help take a, a small family business with a chain of restaurants during during a really uncertain time where there's a lot of small family restaurants that that went under because of of COVID and not knowing what to do or how to adapt and not having the right partner not having someone like you guys to help them think outside the box, analyze the data, and make the incremental changes that can help. So I think that's uh, I think that's True. great. You know, I, I, uh, having departments speak one another is also something we take uh, very seriously. We, we don't have. A, say per se I'll just simplify it a person that operates PPC another person that builds a sales funnel another another team that that uh, manages SEO another team that does web design and development no we overlap the skill sets we train for Google Analytics we train all of our team, team members to um, uh, be certified in Google paid ads um, 
it's a very agile, dynamic uh, industry. And it's our job to stay on top of our day-to-day, but also um, in terms of, you know, future trends, pre- preparing and planning for those efficiencies. Right. So that means your team needs to be very, very much agile and trained and understand they, may, they don't have to be an SEO expert. No. But we do have SEO experts. They need right. to understand the data. They need to understand <clears throat> how to research. They need to understand how to strategize and plan. And then that's how you have collaboration amongst departments that will, I call it knowledge-based sharing, and, and that's how you raise the floor, right? right? We raise the floor, not the ceiling. The ceiling is always moving, but you raise the floor. So from floor to ceiling is very, very, very short and precise. And it's very efficient, and the, the performance improves, and the team, you know, there's longevity in our, in our, in our staff because of this, this modeling that we have in place, okay. and that's just how we operate. And, and I believe that's a very much unique differentiator in our industry. Yeah, I would, I would agree with you, and I also think it's a very critical one. I think it's a critical one to have, um, you know, not not only not only staff that's been with you, but just staff that that knows your 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 expectations as as a as a leader and as an owner. That you know, from customer service, from okay, this didn't work. How do we fix this? Like all of those things that you know, unfortunately, some businesses might not think that in depth about. But, you know, people that are really, as you said, and, and I believe I, I'm, I'm similar in this, that you almost put yourself in your, in your client's shoes and, you know, if, if they're struggling, you're struggling and, and you just so much want to help them and, and, and because you, you, you're vested. You, you know it's not just they're a client. They're a partner. You have been brought on to help them make sure they're growing or they're eliminating some of the higher-end costs or some of the struggles or hesitations they're having because you can help them kind of separate that, uh, that emotion because, you know, it's their business. And you're you're an outside set of eyes, but you're still a partner, and it's still their struggle is your struggle. And I think that is something, no matter what industry you're in in today's world, I think that is completely gone by the wayside. And I give you a ton of credit that you still are that much of a relationship firm that you care that much about your clients, because that is something that is, to me, that is something that I wish I could just like wave my magic wand and say, everyone needs to care about helping each other. If you're an expert in this field and you know you're going to be working with this company or this individual because you know you can add value and help them, then you need to have that vested interest and have that compassion and that passion every day to do whatever you can to help them make sure that you're bettering their situation. A hundred percent. I agree with you a hundred percent. If you're not invested, invested meaning you need to roll up your sleeves, dive into their business, right? Get yep. bumped and bruised along the way, ask a ton of questions, get all this information, take it back, and then figure it out, yep. right? And, and, and if you don't do that, then what you do figure out or what you do propose is very topical. You're not getting, you're not getting beneath that hard shell where all the gears and the pulleys and the buttons and the lights and everything is going on. You need to really get in and get involved or um, the results will just be mediocre right. at best. Yep, exactly. Yep, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. So, you know, help me, help me understand, you know, we, we've, we've obviously talked about, you know, one case study. Is there, whether it's a small business, a mid-sized business or a larger business, is there any is there any area of industry that you feel a you've been able to help more than others or or are you do you guys really pride yourself on being able as you say and I love the word uh be tactical to adjust on the industry and the business and be able to help them you know no matter what i i'm just more curious for the for the audience as far as the the industries that you've had a lot of success in 
Um, yeah, uh, healthcare, uh, manufacturing. I, I come from a, a tech, you know, very technical um, and manufacturing production uh, background. Okay. Um, financial fintech, um, and um, I would just guess what really excites me is getting the call says, hey, Ramsey, I was referred to you by, by so-and-so, and, and, you know, we, we've got some challenges here. Um, we, we've hit a, a glass ceiling, and uh, we're, we're failing. We, we need some help with something um, in particular. And, and I get excited because I, I don't know them. I don't know their, their business. It may be a new industry. It may be something related to an industry um, uh, that we're familiar with. And I, I reel it back, and the first something my mind starts spinning, and I say, okay, I need to understand your business. What are your problems? Um, who are you working with? What, what departments do you have in marketing? Does, does IT speak to marketing? Do they not speak at all? Is there any communication at all amongst the, in, in making a decision? And then you start understanding their sales process too because – if you're driving, if you're driving leads, not sales, you drive leads, and and your your sales team is not equipped to in in the digital era here how to manage the sales, then it doesn't matter what type of business or industry you're in, you're you're going to get the same results. You have high turnover, you have loss, um, and there won't be much stickiness from all of your efforts. Folks just get frustrated. So yeah. we need to identify we need to identify these these things. And it doesn't matter what type of business it is. Um, having the acumen to audit and take that information back, you go through another several series of, of rounds of, uh, of questions. And, and then it's, you know, the modeling takes place from there. Um, in, in particular, we have on the other end of the spectrum, your, your enterprise level. We have a client called Travelex. They're a UK-based company. Um, they're uh, uh, very much um, in, involved in the World Cup 2022 in Qatar, and it's okay. been a highlight um, campaign that we're really focused heavily on and had tremendous success um, because you have geographical restrictions. We're targeting over uh, 17 different countries. Um, why we won the project is because of our tactical thinking and abilities and things that we, we keep kind of, you know, revisiting and repeating in terms of tactical. And we didn't have a huge fintech background. Um, so what they are is they're a foreign currency exchange provider and they have kiosks in the airports and on the ground within the regions of Europe and the Middle East, the MENA and the GCC region. Um, and they came to us through another agency that is purely creative, and um, we hit it off. So we said, okay, how do you see your product in the hands of your audience, your target audience? He says, well, we, have, we, we don't have a, like a charge card where someone is coming from, say, you know, England, and they're traveling to Dubai a week before, and they're going to vacation, and then they'll take a charter or uh, a bus to Qatar to um, watch the, the World Cup 2022. You have to have an exchange in currency, and maybe not just in one country, but possibly two or three countries. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and it's based on our research and their research. They know best. Um, and we said, okay. So prior to, to – I'll give you a very high-level um, perspective. Right. Prior to, we would need X amount of dollars, we feel, based on the teams that made it to the World Cup. So we targeted – we call it geofencing. So we geotargeted an address, a location, a physical location, a brick-and-mortar they were okay. soccer stadiums, professional soccer, soccer stadiums at all of these countries, Argentina, Spain, um, uh, the, the U.K., Germany, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, 
Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, um, all, all of these nations, right? And we said all of their professional league stadiums, anyone that breaches that address, meaning they, they pull into the parking lots, they walk into the stadium, now they start seeing our ads in preparation for the World Cup. Yeah. Because everyone's going to need to convert their currency. So we, they developed a, um, a promotion, and that pro- promotional card gave them a membership, and it was called um, like a, a same-rate guarantee, which allowed them to, what they bought in for when they return to their country, they convert whatever remaining dollars they have back at the same rate. So um, and there's value in that to their, their target audience, right, their consumers. So for us, that was one method. The other method is what happens when they enter the airport. So we're tagging them at their national airports, and then we're tagging them again in, the, uh, in Qatar and Dubai and Saudi Arabia in particular. Wow. And from there, when they enter the stadium in Qatar, they trip, there's a trip wire, they trip that stadium, and then they're also given another set of um, ads that are unique to uh, their promotion for the World Cup 2022. Been a tremendous success. Tremendous success. Then we have some, some other techniques that we applied. I won't get into too much detail and sharing a full strategy, but um, we're able to measure all of these, these trip wires and events and the ad spend and, um, and working with corporate because it's not really a, a, a measurable, like a, 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 a transaction. We're just looking at subscriptions as opposed to dollar amounts. And, um, right. yeah, it's been, been a lot of fun. A, a, a great client, great group of people, very trusting. Um, they were new to uh, advanced digital strategies, and they immediately picked up on the differences from, between our agency and, and other quotes that, that also many, many quotes from all over the world that competed for the same business, and we were awarded the full campaign. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that's something, I mean, that's something that's uh, not only is, I mean, not only can it be life changing, but it's also unforgettable. I mean, that's, that's something that you can never forget and you will never forget, but you can also, I mean, the fact that you, it's been a, a raging success is it, it, it's, I can't even put it into words, Ramsey. I can't even imagine what, what your pride and, 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 and your just joy of, of you and your team and what you guys have been able to accomplish with that, um, especially, you know, being a, you know, just, just watching some of it, you know, as, as a whole, just knowing kind of you guys were kind of behind the scenes helping drive people, you know, like you said, geofencing, all the things to make sure that it was a successful campaign and the fact that, you know, you guys won the campaign was was absolutely unbelievable, and I, I congratulate you guys and the and the success you've had so far. And obviously, with some of the things you've accomplished already, I think you guys are are still in line for a, a ton of success going forward. So, is there is there any final thoughts that that you want to give the listeners before we kind of wrap up? Yes. Uh, AI is up and, up and coming um, as the premier method of gathering intelligence, but being agile. And what I mean by agile, agile marketing is you have to be quick on your feet. You have to be dynamic because it's a yep. very fast paced and, and ever so quickly changing uh, industry. And, and then while you're agile, you need to plan and strategize for up and coming trends. And, and, and the metrics, the data supports this agile approach shows that you know, you're, you're ever so changing on a monthly basis by about 15%. So whatever you're doing today, expect next month that there's going to be some sort of, of evolution or change or shift in campaign and, and, and um, user trends, right? Yeah. So, by 15%. So that means you, you, need, to, you need to optimize um, for these, this 15% rule and plan 
and keep the client ahead of the curve. Um, the only way to do this really is with automation driven by intelligence gathered by, by AI, artificial intelligence. So this yep. machine learning will help and provide the real-time custom, like customer needs. What are they searching for? What are they looking for? Where, where are they coming from upstream? What are they doing on page? Where are they going off page downstream? And then how do I devise a plan? And then how do I, how do I automate this process? That, that is where the industry, it's, it's kind of evolved and grown into this. Okay. And um, machine learning cannot be ignored. And uh, um, that's something that you should consider if you're drafting an RFP is uh, how automation comes into play, if, if at all. Okay. I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's great input and great advice on, uh, on some, of the, some of the cutting trends that uh, it's really started to evolve more and more into. And I think people, if they're not looking at, you know, artificial intelligence and, you know, how, how, they, how we can capture and gather data through that, they're, uh, they're a little behind the times. And I think they need to really reach out to someone that is heavily looking at that. So, Ramsey, if any of our listeners, you know, if you've, if you've you know, encourage them and, 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 you, and they see the type of work that you're able to do and they want to reach out, what's the, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, the best way to get a hold of me is to either you know, call our office or email strategy at Akabatech, A-Q-A-B-A-T-E-C-H dot com, and our phone number is area code 248. Two seven five one two two two, and my extension is one hundred one. Be happy to have a conversation and uh, share a cup of coffee with you. Yeah, and we 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 appreciate that. I mean, this is obviously tremendous value for our our followers and our listeners. And this is this is what this is all about. This is why we do this. This is why we enjoy having conversations with industry leaders like yourself. So want to, again, thank you for your time and, uh, and expertise and thoughts. Um, this has been another uh, great episode of the Inspired Business Leaders podcast uh, with Ramsey Swice. And uh, just want to say uh, thanks for our listeners uh, for taking the time and look forward to seeing you or listening to you next time. Thanks so much, Ramsey, for your time again, and uh, look forward to, uh, to talking again soon. Nick, thank you for having me. All right, take care. Thank you for listening to the Inspired Business Leaders Podcast, brought to you by Inspire Wealth. To learn more about the topics mentioned on today's show, or to listen to past episodes, visit www.inspiredbusinessleaderspodcast.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.